Uh, this week, I want to I want to divide the day into two halves. First part of the day, I'm going to talk about the the midterm and give you guys a, a heads up about like the, the, the way that the midterm will will work, so you understand the kinds of questions I'll be asking and, and the way that I'll be asking them. And we're going to sort of have a like a like a pop quiz. Okay, you're not going to be graded on or anything like that, but I'm going to ask you some questions. Uh, and then the second part of the day, I'm going to talk about um, the, the remaining piece of project one, which is going to be to actually document your scripts that you guys have been working on for your precedent. Um, there are two videos posted online right now. If you go to Moodle, there is a video uh, about uh, diagramming, which is going to be pretty familiar to some of you guys that I had for second year because it's going to be using Make2D. So we're going to essentially be using Make2D with the various um, phases of our, of our script to create a series of diagrams. I put examples of the diagrams on Moodle so you know what kinds of things I'm looking for. Okay? These are basically step-by-step -step visual explanations of how your script you know, works. So it might be like, I'm going to start with a series of points and then I'm going to move them and then I'm going to make lines with them and those are going to make you know, like a loft. You know? So you're just going to take people through visually. This is really useful for like studio, it's really useful for your clients, so I want you guys to practice that. The second video that I have is about rendering. Now we haven't like explicitly taught you guys much about uh, rendering, and so I want to give you. Uh, this is a good chance to practice this, so that even in, in studio this semester for your final presentations, you guys could get some really nice renderings. Okay, so um, you'll be you'll be doing as part of your um, submission some simple renderings. Like I'm going to give you a template. You're not going to have to configure a lot of stuff, but you're going to get the process of outputting something from Grasshopper. You know, baking it in Rhino and then rendering it so it's really pretty, okay? And that will be included in your submission for me. Uh, now, I realize that some of you guys, like the third years, a lot of you guys are going on a trip, right? Um, yes. Some of Well, the midterm is, is, is Monday and uh, Wednesday, depending on what studio you have. The no, the 30th and the 2nd, like this coming Monday. Uh, next week. Yeah, next week. Yeah, okay. During travel week, uh, I am going to be uh, gone, and you are going to be gone. So what I'm going to do is everything is going to be online, and you'll do it like whenever you like feel like it. You can do it when you get back. You could do it on the plane. You can do it during your trip. Probably not, right? But I'm going to let you. I'm going to let you guys off the hook. So there there isn't any like class during that week, but I do want you guys to keep up with the material. Uh, because we're going to be starting a new project when you guys get back, okay? What I am going to do though, because I realize that some of you guys are leaving like earlier and some of you guys are going to be like busy with other midterms or whatever, is I'm going to push this so that it's due after you guys get back from your like travel um, week. I'm sorry, no, wait, hang, hang on. I had originally said it was due on the uh, 4th of October, which is next Friday, but I wanted to give you guys some time to work on it. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm, because just the, if, if some of us are not gonna be around, some of us are, there's no reason to make it due uh, early. So I pushed it to the 11th, which is that, that Friday. Now that's when it's due, okay? You can always turn it in before that, okay? So don't, don't complain to me that I made it due when you guys are gone or you're busy or like whatever. That's just like the last day that it's, that it's accepted. Some of you guys aren't going, some of you are going. If you are going, just make time to get it done before you leave. You, you could finish it by the 4th when I plan to, but I figured some of you guys like to take extra time on it, so I'm going to give you another week just because. Okay? Does that make sense? So for some of you, it won't change anything, but for others, you, it'll, it'll, it'll maybe give you a little bit of extra time if you need it. Um, if you guys have, if that won't work for you, let me know. Like I, there's like three different classes represented here, so I don't have all your schedules quite worked out, but I think I know what most of you are doing, so let me know. Okay. To that end, uh, the, some of you, the, the master's students, have a lot of stuff going on this Monday. So you can take your midterm on Wednesday if you like, okay? Um, just just, just uh, like make that arrangement. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. You know, I, I, want, I want to give you three things to do on Monday. So come in on Wednesday to take your midterm if you, if you want to. The other, uh, but you can also come in. So on Monday and Wednesday, the midterm will be half of the class. And the other half of the class, I'm gonna answer questions with you guys about anything you guys are doing with your scripts or anything you guys are talking about with renderings or with diagramming, okay? So it's another kind of like study hall kind of work session. So if you are in that, in that, in that, in, in that studio that has things due Monday, you can still come into lab and I'll help you out with your stuff, okay? But you don't have to take the midterm that Monday, okay? 
every lab, every section is going to have a different midterm. So you you taking it at a different time is not going to give you a leg up on it. It's still going to be your own midterm. Okay. So and and but but the but the general way the questions will be asked will be the way that I'm going to talk about them today. Okay. I'll send this out in an email so this makes more sense. Does that is that all you guys understand what's happening? Okay. So Monday, Tuesday, midterm slash study hall. Okay. Then the the final this project is put to bed by by next Friday or before that if that works for you. Okay. Um, and uh, if you guys have questions about it, let me know. So basically, the the the, pro the end of this is just documenting what you guys have have worked on. What you guys need to be doing, uh, I talked about this last week, is you do have to make your script do something uh, differently or better than the precedent that you uh, started with. So you started by, by making it look like the precedent, but yours has to take it a step further, okay? Just to be clear about that, okay? And that's what you should have been working on this past, this past week, okay? And I think I talked to all the groups about what I thought was a step further. If you still have questions about what that is, or, and if you've met that goal, let me know. Okay. Okay. Any questions about all this upcoming stuff? Forever hold your peace. All right. Okay. So the midterm. So a question that I might ask might be something as simple as this. I might say, why is parametric design useful to architects? Right? We're in this class. We're studying computation. Architects are doing this stuff. Why is this important? Okay. So I'm going to give you a reason why parametric, why parametric design is useful to architects. Dan. Okay, so yeah, it extends our capabilities. Yeah, so that when we when we're using the powers of the computer, there are things that we just couldn't we couldn't do by hand. Maybe things are complex, or we're trying to account for a lot of variables. We're trying to make things smarter. Okay, good. That's a really good reason. Okay, others. Yeah. Oh no, Maggie. It takes a lot of time, a lot of That's great. Yeah, if you want to make changes, which clients love and, and always happen, so it allows us to make changes quickly. You got it. It okay. allows us to be flexible for like certain conditions. Right? Flexibility, exactly. And if we make something and it's pretty good, right, we could take it into another project and just like modify it, basically, right? So we're not we're not like repeating ourselves a lot of times. So, I mean, what's great about it is it's not exactly the same thing. It's a variation on that on that thing. That's a really powerful uh, tool. Good. Okay. Anything else? Give me one more. Somebody give me one more. What are the effects of that, maybe? Like, if we are flexible and uh, if we do things like faster, what might be like an impact of that? Or if things are smarter? Better product. Okay, so maybe improving quality, we'd say that, that's good. Okay. What does quality usually cost? <laughs> what's, a, what's an offshoot of parametric design? I mean, you're spending less, you can spend less time and have different iterations of a design idea that you can show a client. Okay, so quality would improve because you get to try try more things and you can save some money, maybe. Like if we if we can make things smarter, if we can if we can reuse things, okay. Clients might disagree. We might be charging them more for parametric design, or they might enable us to do more changes than we could have done before. So that might that might increase our billing. But but yeah, the idea ostensibly is it might it might actually be more efficient. It might save us might save us money. It might save the client money. We might reduce waste in a product uh, and if we're if we're if working on like a project. The other thing that you might say is that it might be more ecologically like friendly if we can incorporate energy analysis into our like parametric designs, right? If we're less wasteful, if we're if we're understanding you know the energy input and output, that could be better for the environment. So parametric design like has a lot of uses for architect. Okay, so that's the kind of question I might ask you. Okay, and I think it's, if you don't if you don't have an answer to the question, like we're in big trouble because this is like what we're doing. Okay. So, so that kind of question is useful. So, yeah, encode design logic is, is, is useful. We can, we, can, we can encode our process into a form. Variability, efficiency, all that stuff. Oh, I sure am. And I have this, and I'm, and I'm recording this too. So, yeah. Okay. Oh, another question I might ask. Give a real world example of a parametric design constraint. So we, we've talked about this a couple of times. Like, what, what's a real, like, design constraint? Site is a great constraint, right? The dimensions of the site, the boundaries, code would be would would be part of that. What's another design constraint? ADA. ADA. ADA would be a design constraint. The slope of something, right? We would program it so that we could not violate a one to twelve or a one to twenty slope, depending upon what we're doing. Perfect. Yes. Well, uh, one more. 
Cost is always a great uh, is always a great factor. Yeah. What's that? Morphosis. Yeah. Uh, design constraint. Is that? I mean, what do you what do you mean by like morphosis? Uh, uh, no, there are groups that um, use the parametric design constraint. But I'm trying to think of a of a of a constraint in a design. Maybe not someone that uses design constraints, but 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 something in a project or as part of a design process. So if we think of we said cost was one. What's a what's a physical property of 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 the world that's a design constraint? We really can't gravity, right? Who said that one? Okay. Uh, Jen, good. Gravity is like the big one, right? You're never going to escape that. So when you're doing structural calculations, right, the the, the rate of gravity is going to be a design constraint. So yeah, basic basic question. Okay, so size of site, um, amount of material would be something too. If we have a limited amount of material, or we want to reduce waste. Proportional logic would be another design constraint. So if we're thinking like Michael Swisher, we have a, a certain grid we want to fit. We want a certain rhythm, right? Our design is not going to violate that. So we're going to encode that as a design constraint. Transportation limitations. I don't think we have anybody on solar decathlon here because they'd probably be there. But uh, sort of Cathlon had designed there so that it would fit on uh, like a rail car or, or, like the, or, or like the bed of a truck. Okay, so that's a constraint. We don't want to violate that. You know, the like weight of that would be one of the design constraints. Okay. 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 So I would, might give you an example like this and I would say label the independent dependent variables and constants. Okay. So quick, what are the, what are the dependencies in this? I know it's going to be hard to do this, but... Where, how do we find a dependency in a script? What is a dependency, anyway? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, okay, so it takes information from something else, like it's dependent upon the information, so how do we find one in a, in a script? How do we know something's dependent upon something else? Would a number slider be a dependency? What would be a variable? It's a variable. Would it be a dependent or an independent variable? A number slider. Independent. independent. Why? There's no input, right? It is the input. Okay, so it's an independent variable. Okay, so what would be a dependent variable? Yeah, exactly. So not, not anything that has inputs, because if we have, I mean, you, you, you could, I guess you could make an argument, but like functionally, it's something that is, that is um, taking, taking you know, inputs from, from something else and, and, and it's being like modified by it. So we might say that, um, okay, so in this script, somebody uh, tell me what, uh, point out one dependency in this, in this script. The math components are dependent. Okay, so this one's taking the two inputs. So if this one, if this one changes, it's going to change the other side. Okay, so whatever this value is itself is actually a. So that's actually like a you know sort of like dependency. This is particularly a dependency because it's actually getting it inputs. It's this plus this plus that again, which is going to move this right. So that that whole thing is actually dependent. Uh, that that whole chain. Okay, what's a constant that we see in this script? The two, right? Because it's not, it, first of all, it's independent, like nothing's, nothing's modifying it. And two, it's difficult to modify. I mean, we said it's, it's, it's functionally uh, a, a, a constant. We could modify it, but it's much harder to modify it than the number slider, okay? So yeah, so, so being able to like recognize like where these are, being able to recognize like why they're in, why these are important, okay? We have variables because they're because they're easy to change. We have dependencies because we want we want this logic to affect logic downstream. We have constants because sometimes there's things that, that don't change in a project. Okay, if you if you play with these in a smart way, right, you can optimize your script. It's going to be it's going to be easier for you to get what you want, and you because uh, you have you have less things to change, and you're changing the right things. Okay. Okay. So yeah. So and I would have accepted this. So independent variables are the two sliders. The de dependent variables are the math components. And the constant is the two. It's important because in this, in this instance, if we're talking about variables and constants, they're values and they're numbers. If you told me that the geometry is, is really, is really you know, like a dependency, I might not agree with you because I'm really interested in the values that go into the geometry, or the values that go into the transform, or the values 
that go into you know like the later transforms. Okay, so we're really talking about you know like numerical information when we're talking about variables. Okay, you can make a huge philosophical argument about that the geometry is variable, the geometry is dependent, but I mean like functionally we're really talking about like values. Okay. Yep, yeah, Maggie. I might ask something like that, but I'm really, in this case, I'm interested in just the independent dependent variables. I think these are kind of self-explanatory, like what they are. Okay. But I'm just pointing out the difference, like this, this might be a thing that would trip you up. If you don't think too hard about it, I'm just going to be looking at these, at, these, at these ideas, okay? So this is like review, it's not that hard. Okay, so study this comment, so I might give you questions to study the scripting pattern and answer the following questions. Okay, first of all, what does this pattern do? Divides the surface. I heard a couple of whispers there. Yeah, divides the surface. Really, really common like pattern, right? Okay, so I'll ask you some questions about it. So, okay, what are the inputs and what is the output? Okay, what are the inputs? Pretty easy question. The surface is an input, so a reference surface, and then the other inputs are? Yeah, they're like numbers, they're U and V. Okay, and what's the output? Divided surface, right, is the output. So pretty easy. Okay. In terms of parametric form generation, okay, we talked about that. What constraint would you set for both sliders to make sure the script always works correctly? So let's think about the opposite way. What's a way to break this script with the inputs? Zeros are not whole numbers because you can't have a fraction of a, of, a, of a surface, okay? And you can't have zero because then you've got nothing. What's another, what's another one? Now, those are the two big ones. What's, what's a variation of that that would actually break this? Whole numbers, right? Positive numbers, okay? So if you, had, if you had a negative number, that would break it also, right? You can't have a negative for that. So that's what I would ask. It's a pretty simple one, okay? Would anything enter into this about odds or evens, like odd or even numbers? Do we care about that? Is that a constraint? No, it doesn't really matter, okay? Yeah. That is something you can do to a slider, and sometimes you need to do it as a constraint to make sure, okay? What about the amount of the sliders? Okay, we said it has to be bigger than zero. Is there an upper limit? No? If I made this like a thousand, is that okay? Is it really okay? It'd probably break, right? Because it'd be slow. Yeah, so if we were kind, I mean, yeah, functionally, we have like a, you know, if we had like a graphene sort of, you know, supercomputer, maybe we could get this really high, but we might just limit it because we don't want the computer to run too slowly, and maybe we don't, we don't want something that's that complicated. So we might set an upper limit to these to be something reasonable, like like 20 or 50 or something like that. Right? We would not make it uh, super high, but that would be, you know, that would be kind of pushing the question. So yeah, non-zero positive numbers, integers, whole numbers, not too large. I would, I would accept not too large, but the first two are the most important ones. Okay. Which of the following is not a method of object distribution? So we talked about different methods for getting, getting a lot of objects into certain positions, right? Making grids of things, making like rows of things, propagating things along curves, along surfaces. Which one of these does not distribute uh, objects? Let's call them A, B, or C. Okay, let's go through. Does move distribute objects? Who said no? Move does, right? Because if we, uh, how does move distribute objects? If you have more than one, uh, if you have more than one input, then it's going to distribute multiple outputs. So move is a valid is a valid distribution. And in fact, I mean, I could say that it, if I move one thing, I'm actually distributing one thing, right? Okay. Does is horizontal frames a method of object distribution? Who thinks yes? Let me raise hands. One person? Two people? Wait, I think yes. Okay, yeah. Why is horizontal frames a method of distribution? I think that answer, and the answer is orient, and that's why I think it's not. You think, you think orient's not a method of distribution? Yeah. Does so anybody agree with Jen? Maybe raise a hand. It's not a method of distribution, orient? What does orient do? It distributes. <laughs> it distributes. Wait, uh, yeah. It orients. Orient, orient remember, takes, uh, takes the position of something and a new position, and it distributes over the new position. 
So Orient, Orient is one of the best tools for distribution. Okay. Let's get, let's get back to horizontal frames. Horizontal frames, how is it a method of distribution? Like, how do we use it? Remember horizontal frames, we have a line, we distribute frames over it, so it has these really nice you know, frames that flow with it. And then we do what with those frames? Yeah, you, you can distribute objects. So if I have a box and I have a horizontal frames, a box usually takes a plane, or I get a point along it, and it's gonna flow along that thing. So that's a method of distribution. Okay. Orient is a method of distribution. Like it's it's one of the, it's one of the purest. If you have if you have some object and you have a series of planes or a series of locations, Orient will distribute it to all those locations. Okay. Now I will remind you guys. If you guys are like suddenly freaking out or whatever, you're going to have Grasshopper available to you. Okay, in in in, in the lab, so or, or on your laptop. So if you don't know, you could just go through process of elimination and like try these things. Okay, it might take you a little while. But you could, if you if you don't remember what Orient does, you could open up Orient and like look at it basically, or you could you could try to plug some things into it to see what it does. Okay, okay, okay. So that leaves us with contour component, and I've kind of eliminated I've kind of eliminated the other one. So why is contour component not a method of distribution? What does contour do? <clears throat> Makes contours, right? Yeah, and I don't. I mean, of all these, like, if you want to, again, you can try to argue with me about it, but I don't, I think it just makes, it makes contours. I don't think it, like, distributes objects. It takes one thing and transforms it into something else. Okay? So that's the one, that's the odd man out. Okay? So I'll be tricky. I will ask you, I'll ask you questions like this, which is not something. Okay? And so you have to think about the, the, the solutions. Okay? Okay. Yes. Contour generates curves. It does not directly apply. The other options are more specific choices. Okay, name of three basic transforms. This is like a really easy one. What are they? Move, scale, rotate. Yes, good. That's a great question. Okay, so relevant because these are not going away. They're essential in programming and 3D modeling. Matrix transformations are huge in scripting. So you gotta know, you gotta know what these are. These are huge in architecture. These are, these are the foundations. Like you have geometry, and you can do these things to geometry and you get more complex forms, okay? So I would say something like which is the which of the following is not uh, or, sorry which of the following is a basic transform? You're going to answer what? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So I would ask you a question like that. Okay. Then I have a series of topology questions. Okay. So name two methods to create a parametric surface using curves. Maybe one method. Making a surface using curves. True. Good. It's true. That's one. Give me another one. Loft sweep, yes. Right, that's two. So there's three. So already we got like we're, we're over or over our limit. What else? What else is a way of making a surface using curves? Surface from edges. Surface from edges. Surface from edges. Great. That's an advanced one. Yes. Good. What's another thing that's like a sweep, but it's easier to work with? What's that? <laughs> but it might be easier to work with. Um, it's like Twizzlers, you know, like it makes uh, makes little ropey objects. Pipe. Pipe. Yes. Technically, it's a surface. It uses curves. Pipe. I would accept pipe also. Okay. So that's that. If you guys, you know, are familiar with with the patterns that we've been doing, you can answer this question. Okay. You could always, you know, in a panic, open up Surface and start like dragging things out and seeing if it takes inputs as curves. But you'll figure figure this one out. So good. Loft curves, extrude, sweep, pipe, planar surface, and edge surface. Planar surface is just a closed flat surface, and it creates a surface. Okay. If you need that. Good. Name a component that'll generate points using surfaces as an input. Okay. So how do we get points out of a surface? What are what are ways we can do that? Divide surface. Yep. That's a good one. Uh, B rep explode would give us points. It would give us the vertices of a, of a, uh, of a surface. Yep. What about when I try to distribute stuff over a surface? What's, what's, one, of the, what's one of the tools we use? Area, area was an, is another good one. Man, you're knocking them out. Okay. Okay, area is a good one. I would accept volume too, because technically that'll that'll do it. Any others? That's pretty good. Any others? 
All right, so it's a surface point, surface divider is actually a surface point. Area volume, evaluate surface. Remember all that rigmarole, if we want to get things to actually flow along a surface, we can evaluate a surface to find you know, things near it, and we get, we get points on the surface. Okay, name a component that will generate lines, shapes, or curves using numbers as an input. This is pretty ubiquitous. So if I got numbers and I want to get a line or a shape or a curve, what's a way to do that? Line component, uh, the line like X, Y, Z, or I'm sorry, the, the SDL line, if we have numbers, line usually takes uh, you know, two points as input, but we have the SDL line, which will take, take a number for the length. That's kind of, I'll accept that one. What about shapes? What kinds of shapes do we know how to make? What's that? Squares. Squares? Well, rectangles. Yeah. Yeah. What's another one? Circles. We can make circles. What else? Polygons. Polygons. Yes, right? That's a shape. It takes a number, right? Take a radius, take a number of edges. Easy peasy. Okay. Lines, shapes. What about a curve? How do we make a curve with, with numbers? We do that? Well, the series is where you get the numbers from. That would give you nerves curve. Actually, okay, these are the ones. So I've got. I think. I think actually most of these are are shapes. I actually I should change that question. So this is one. If I screw up a question, I won't penalize you. I will go back and change it. Okay. An SDL line is, is acceptable for a line or a curve. Um, but I'm looking just for like a single, a single thing. I mean, you could use graph mapper to get you points and then points to get you curves, but it's not like a direct number to curve relationship, okay? This seems really pedantic or like boring or dumb, I know, but like it's, this is actually like what's really important when, when, you're, when you're trying to create geometry, you gotta know like what kind of information you have and what you wanna get, okay? And so actually knowing some of these things off the top of your head and knowing these patterns, you know, is, is, really, is really useful to have. The more automatic this is, the easier it becomes later on to do this stuff, okay? And then you won't, you won't be stumped, you know, like later. Okay, which of the following is not a way to make a parametric rectangle? Okay, so is A, can we make a rectangle with point and line components? God, I hope so, okay. Can we make a rectangle with a surface component? How would, you, would we do that? Can we do that? Who says yes? Hands. Okay, couple. Who says no? Oh, man, you guys are like, come on, just like, I don't know. Okay, let's, let's, let's table that one. Can we make a rectangle with a polygon component? How? Set it with four sides. Gold star, Mason. Awesome. Okay. Can we make a rectangle with a rectangle component? Please don't say no. <laughs> Wake up. Okay. So by process of elimination, we could say the surface component. But do you understand why like, someone could say, oh, I could draw a rectangle or whatever? Well, that's not the point. Like The surface is, component doesn't make a rectangle. It references something, right? But it doesn't actually generate a rectangle. Certainly not parametrically, okay? That's a gotcha, like that, you might, you might overthink that, but that's, that's not, the, the other ones are much better like options, okay? That's what I'll do to you. So yeah, we saw this electric demo, four-sided polygon, thanks Mason, and duh, okay. Which of the following is not a way to convert a curve or a set of curves into a surface, okay? So we've got curves and we want a surface. We actually just talked about this. Which of these is not a way to do that? Offset, good. What does offset do? Offsets, right? Yeah, if you have a curve, right, it's going to produce a copy of that curve at some, at some distance, right? But is that a surface? No, that's another curve, right? And the other way to offset something is if you have a surface and you offset it, but we're not, that's not a curve to begin with, right? So by process elimination, the offset's the, the wrong choice, okay? Okay, okay. So I might ask you a question about debugging. If you find yourself stuck on a problem, what are two strategies for getting unstuck? What's the strategy for getting unstuck? Work backwards. Yes, work backwards. Okay, right, yep. Yeah. What's another one? Using a panel to see like the inputs and outputs. Visualize something, good, yes. Always a good strategy. 
You could also talk to your teddy bear. All right, that's another one. Okay. What's another strategy for getting unstuck? <coughs> Try diagramming it. That would be really good, too. What would Don Draper do? What's that? I was going to say, just reflect on a lot of things. He probably, he'd probably drink, but, but after, he, <laughs> after he drank, what, is, what does he do in his office most of the time? You know, when he's not working, or when he is working? He takes a nap, right? He takes a break. Like, he's, all, he's, const, he's constantly not working. So, one thing to get unstuck would be just to take a break. I don't condone, you know, drinking, whatever, but... <laughs> Um, take a break. Uh, any more? All right, we'll keep going here. All right, so t t talk, talk to uh, another person. Take a break, take a walk, take a sandwich. Uh, start again. I like working backwards. I like diagramming. I mean, I think, I think about you know, getting unstuck um, as, as being taking a pause or taking stock of what we're actually doing. But I, those other ones are fine. So I could say which of the following is not an effective way to improve your chances with debugging. Okay, so does using a panel help you with debugging? I think so, right? Taking a break, does that help you with debugging? We just talked about that. Does using the same sliders for multiple components, is that an effective way to improve your chances with debugging? Probably not. Uh, does isolating the problem with a smaller script? Yeah, so and again, even if you wanted to argue with me about like C, the other ones are better, are better options, okay? I think C is just going to confuse you. Like the more, it's it's just um, it's not necessarily helpful. All right. Okay. So another question I'll ask you might be about debugging. So I'll give you some output. The output should look like A, but instead it looks like B. What is the source of the bug in this script, and how would you fix it? And I'll give you a hint. If you look at these from above, this is what's happening. Okay. So that's A and that's B. We want A, but we got B. What's the source of the bug? Is this an area, um, area would probably fix it, but what's the bug? The center of rotation is off, right? We did not, we are using the same center of rotation for all of these when we want each one to have its own center of rotation, which we would do with an area component. You guys catch that? Okay. And the reason I ask this is because, again, you'll plug something in and you're like, oh, like, why didn't that work? Well, it's like, instead of, I mean, the, the, the biggest thing that's gonna help you debugging is having a library of like patterns for common errors, okay? So that's a pretty natural error, okay? So I would ask you a question like that. If you needed to know what that looks like. Okay, yes. Relevance, the problems with planes are really common. It's, uh, it's also a factor. Okay, any questions about the midterm? Does that seem doable for you guys? So I'm just quizzing you. It'll take about 20, I mean, I'm gonna give you half of the class It'll be six or seven like questions, and it'll be multiple choice, short answer, okay? It'll be just like that, only I'll change the questions, okay? So and no tricks, okay. Okay, so part two. So one of the things, I'm gonna violate my, my principle of the class of, of having you guys do stuff before I talk about it, because we're still kind of in the middle of the project, but I'm gonna introduce some of the, the principles of rendering so that when you guys get into V-Ray, um, that you, you understand what all the switches uh, mean, all right? So, the, um, so let's jump into it. Okay, which one of these is the real building? The one on the left or the one on the right? Is it a real building? Okay. Nobody, does anybody think it's the one on the left? Okay, why, why do we think the one on the right is the, the real building? Oh, well, that's just the graphic. <laughs> it doesn't, so it's fuzzier, so it's the real building. <laughs> so this one's too good. Is that what we're saying? This one's too, too clean? Okay. Do you guys know this project? Who's, who's, whose project is this? Who's the architect? He came to talk to us. Yes, Preston Scott Cohen. What's the project? Tel Aviv Art Museum. Tel Aviv Art Museum, man. Okay, there we go. Gold star. Yes. Interestingly enough, yes, this is the rendering, but is it, isn't it funny? This was the kind of conceptual idea for it. And look at the, look at the realization of that Oculus, you know, which, which it's still good, <laughs> but they cut some corners, like literally. <laughs> um, or they made some corners, I guess. There they were cutting corners. Okay, 
So yeah, what else? I mean, I mean, besides the resolution of it, like what what makes this one like more more or less realistic? So this one's just too is just too good. What does this one have going on for it? It's more dramatic. It's more dramatic. Yeah, definitely the uh, yeah. What else? What what makes it dramatic? Contrast. Contrast. Yes. Yeah, my grand. Yeah, you guys. Okay, good, right? Which one is more visually appealing to us? The one on the left or the one on the right? Yeah, right. I'm going to spend like 150 million dollars on that, right? Okay. So yeah. So the objective of rendering is not to represent reality. You guys get that, right? It, like, I mean, we could fool people, but it's actually to sort of like seduce. It's to convince, you know, people to convince the client to convince yourself. Um, but in, 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 so in, in so doing, rendering is based on physical reality. Like it actually is a, is a simulation of the way that light behaves on a surface and the way that a camera captures light. That's really important, okay? But what we can do is that we can optimize the light and the camera so that we get the best like possible, and in fact an impossible like image, okay? And that's the objective. And so in rendering, I wanna also stress too, rendering is not just for presentation. Shouldn't start with that. Rendering is also about figuring out your project, like the way that your project like works. When I learned how to render, um, I really plunged into this when I was in school. It was actually the thing that started to teach me about like materials. Like I started to, to care about what things were made out of and like what the texture of those things were and what the colors were because it is a physical simulation. Okay, you actually have to care about or have some some idea about what like about what like the gloss of something is or what the texture is. You know, uh, and uh, the ways that things go together, because if you don't have good like, joints on things, your model's not put together well, and you're going to have gaps in the rendering. So this is actually where like, a lot of craft creeps into your, to your model making and the way you think about space. Okay? The other thing you have to think about is light, because you, in, in, you, you can kind of shoot the sun down on it on the best day possible, but you, but you have to know what that is. You also have to fake a lot of this. A lot of this is actually putting fake lights in the model so that you illuminate certain things, okay? Or putting the lights in the model in the proper places, like the overhead spaces, to make sure that those spaces are actually lit. So in a way, I learned a lot about lighting also when I started to learn about uh, rendering, okay? So it is, it is for production in a certain, at a certain level, but it's also like a design tool. You can kind of iterate through your design by experimenting with things in the render, okay? You try something, make a rendering, try another option, make a rendering. So it's, it's not the last part of your process, it's actually something that comes in probably in the middle of your process. This is like even like a schematic design tool. Okay, does that make sense? So I want to encourage you guys when you use it, like don't just open it up the last week of class and try to, you know, banging out a bunch of renderings. Like I really encourage you to start start using it now. And I think you guys are starting your final projects or you're, you're uh, really about to. Um, even in your massing studies, you could you could even do a simple interior or a simple exterior to see the way light behaves on this thing. Okay, so this is going to be a really useful tool for you. Um, okay, so that's why we do it. And and basically, my my goal I'm not going to push it that hard in, in our class, but um, because we just don't have that developed of a project. But I'm going to teach you the basics of it so that you can start to experiment with it in studio. Okay, so rendering is a computational like method. I want to I want to really stress that. In fact, if you want to know that it's computational, listen to your computer, feel the heat like coming off of it when it's trying to crank out a rendering. Okay, it's one of the most computationally intensive things your machine can do. A lot of it's going off into the cloud now, and you guys will, you guys will see that in like some other classes where you'll you'll send it to a server farm somewhere, and it'll do the crunching and it'll send it back to you. But for the time being, and if you don't have internet or whatever, you're going to be rendering it on your machine. Um, so it's very process intensive. You'll see the little like dial you know, on your process they go up to 100%. Um, it's based on physical simulation. So there's computation in there. Like somebody, you know, a lot of people wrote programs to simulate light, to simulate the material, to simulate the camera, and um, that's a form of computation. And it's parametric. Like I can, I can dial in the various settings for the camera and, 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 and those materials and they're usually a bunch of sliders or switches or whatever. So, so it, the process itself is actually parametric. Okay, it's actually an iterative process. Okay, so it can be um, an analytical method. So you could do it. You can simulate daylight in your project, right, with a rendering. So you, you could use something like Vasari or like uh, or something like Ecotech. But to get the qualitative like measure of what a space is going to feel like, you know, what a space is going to look like, you could use a rendering. Okay. 
if you get the sun right, you get the glass right, the materials right, it's almost as good as building a thing to a certain extent. Okay? Okay, so V-Ray is our modeling uh, plugin that we use uh, in school. And I think there's a licensing thing going on with it, which I will, I will fix immediately after this lecture so we can get it to work. It's a plugin uh, that works for Rhino. What's really nice about it is that if you know how to use it in Rhino, you can use it in uh, SketchUp, um, you can use it in Studio Max, so it's not like you just only use it like here. It'll work for a lot of other modeling programs that you guys encounter. It's a, it's a separate plugin that does uh, rendering. It's not included because it's a plugin. I think if you wanted to buy it, it's like really expensive. I think it's $225 last I checked. Um, but we have it on all of our machines. So as part of your process for this course, what you can do is just save your Rhino file and then open it up on one of these machines and you can just crank out the renderings on, on these machines and you can save your laptops, okay? But you do have to plan for that. Um, you can get a demo of it, uh, but I think it only works for like 25 renderings or something like that, which may not be enough for you, okay? So just plan for your renderings, which you're only gonna do a couple, plan to do them on the SOA machines, all right? Okay, so V-Ray, okay. Uh, I thought I cut that slide out, okay, anyway. I used to do a thing about V-Ray and Maxwell, but I won't, we don't have Maxwell, okay. You guys in my second year class did some default like Rhino renderings with some, <coughs> simple, with some simple shadows, mm -hmm. okay? What are the differences between the two styles of rendering? You see V-Ray over here. What, what kinds of, I mean, obviously one looks real and one doesn't, right? But like, what are the visual differences? Like, what do we get with V-Ray that we don't get with the Rhino? Softer shadows. Softer shadows, I heard somewhere. And then what was another? Reflection of light. Reflection of light, yes. There isn't any texture, but the light's doing something. No, it's good. I mean, it's good to think about. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't me. <laughs> what else? What else do we see? Is there anything else? Anything else? Light bouncing. Light bouncing. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so the real, the real big difference is this indirect illumination. So this is direct illumination. So the light's coming through the windows, and it's striking here, and it's basically just changing the color of the floor. <laughs> which looks like light to us, okay? Indirect illumination is actually physically simulating what happens with light. And, and this was really cool to me when I was studying this because I never really even thought about it, but basically photons are coming from the sun or they're coming from some light source. And if you can imagine it, it's like this giant swarm of paintballs or like shotgun pellets or whatever. And they're blasting through this wall at like high speed and they hit the floor and they ping pong around this room. And everywhere that they strike, they're going to kind of paint the room with that, with that light energy, okay? And it bounces, it literally like bounces. And if you looked at each one, it'd be like a laser beam, you know? But, but if you get enough of them, that's light. Like that's actually what light's doing. And they don't actually do like a trillion photons, obviously, but they do a sampling, they average them basically. They, 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 they shoot out like 5,000 of them in an evenly distributed pattern. And then they kind of smooth it all out. So it'd be like if you threw a bunch of paintballs at a thing and then you took a roller and kind of smoothed them out, okay? That's where you get the kind of smudgy, you know, edges of things, the kind of soft edges of things. You're gonna have fewer paintballs like striking a crisp edge, but then as they go out further, you're gonna have more of these like light photon paintballs like striking, and that's gonna fuzz this up. Go outside and like start, <laughs> start looking at the world, but like you can actually see the way that light behaves, and that's what's actually happening, and they've done a pretty accurate like simulation of it. You can see also that because of the light scatter, you know, this is even like sort of illuminated, you know, slightly, right? You can actually start to see um, there's a kind of a dark edge, but it's kind of lit up more. It's actually brighter than the direct illumination, uh, you know, field, okay, over there. The uh, windows, there's almost more contrast in the uh, right image because the windows almost seem brighter by comparison. You can see the kind of bloom that's happening. Um, you know, on this side of the wall, you can see the soft shadow that's actually on the other side of the column. Most of the time we think of shadows as being like cast shadows as edges. There's actually a shadow that's like up there because light can't reach it as well. Okay. So this is like, you know, revealing a lot of interesting artifacts about the way the light, light behaves in this room. Um, I could spend a long time on this, but, and it also helps us define this edge here, the little shadow edge, you know, look at that. You don't even pick up the edge. It's almost like it just plunges into the wall there, into the ceiling. In the V-Ray rendering, you actually recover that, that edge. So not only is it like beautiful or like better looking or like whatever, but it actually helps us describe space better. 
when we're, when, we're, when we're thinking about it, when we're talking about it. And these are spatial effects that as an architect you can actually like manipulate, okay? So it's, uh, you know, it's a good thing to kind of dive into. All right, so this is another, uh, what, other, what other kinds of things do we see? This is another uh, like simple rendering that's using indirect, uh, indirect illumination. What other kinds of uh, light effects are we seeing in this image? Uh, there's not, there are not multiple light sources, but the repeating chair is an interesting thing, right? The fact that it's actually kind of casting this, this kind of shadow. You, you would get that if you had, you, you would get something like it if you had multiple light sources. What's actually happening is, is that the kind of bounce of the room is actually softening up that shadow and sort of creating what looks like a multiple, you know, like multiple projections. It's a small room with a big um, light source that's like spread out, and that's actually creating that effect. This is another thing that's really interesting is like not all of our lights are like light bulbs, you know, that like just, just hang there. If you have lights that are in tubes or lights that are in like half, <coughs> half circles or whatever, they're going to produce a different kind of light effect than, than we're used to seeing, okay, than a, than a window might see. And this is one of the things is this kind of multiple, you can see it on the table too, the kind of multiple cast shadow. I don't know if you guys can see as much as I can on my screen because the contrast is kind of burned out here. What other things do we, are we noticing in this, in this image that are kind of interesting? Uh, the, the multiple shadows is the, is the big one. Anything else? What about the edges of the room here? Like we see this kind of shadow pool in the corner. Okay, this room's lit, but there's actually kind of a, kind of a, dark, kind of a dark corner. You can see the edges of the room you know, that have the same effect. There's actually a sh the light itself actually has a shadow like behind it, which is kind of an interesting, you know, thing. Anyway, okay. What light effect are we seeing? Are we seeing here? What's going on here? We talked about light being reflective, sort of. Yeah. What's happening in the floor tiles? What do we see occurring? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So it's actually because of the 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 color itself, the the, the light and dark. Light materials are going to reflect light, right? Dark materials are going to absorb light, and we can we kind of call it like painting or like reflecting, but it's really it's really just that light pattern. It really doesn't like paint anything. It's just the reflectivity is different, and so you actually get this kind of like effect in the wall. I don't know if you guys have ever, you guys have probably never even like noticed that before, but that is something that can happen. Even if these are not like, you know, like a sort of like a high gloss material, just by virtue of the color that they are, they're going to produce a light effect. Okay. This is known as the Cornell box, and this is a rendering uh, tool. Basically, it's these two uh, spheres that are um, transparent. They have different... Um, Different kinds of um, like magnification, basically. Like one one magnifies a lot, and one um, uh, well one one kind of magnifies, and one kind of shrinks things. They have a different index of uh, different index of like reflection. The walls are painted uh, white in the middle, blue on one side, and red on the other side. And this this is used to like test the accuracy of renders and the speed of renders. Okay, Cornell box. What's happening in this image? Like you guys, are you guys seeing? So the walls are white, but what's happening to them? Do they look that white? Okay, what's going on? What do we see? Yeah, purple, right? Why would it do that? It's blue and red, right? Yeah. So the in a sort of variation of this effect of the material color that we have here, the white and the uh, and the dark material. Light is coming from that light source, and the photons are hitting the blue wall, and, and they're essentially changing the wavelength of that, of that color, so that as it hits the uh, white wall, it actually starts to paint it kind of blue. Same thing is happening on the like, red side. And then somewhere in the middle there, there's kind of a mingling of like, photons or something, and you see this kind of purple uh, thing. You know? uh, and so anyway, the idea of this is that the color can affect a space, if, if, it's, if it's a white space or a light color space and you have a lot of light, you're actually going to change the color of a room slightly. Okay? You can do this experimentally in your own in your apartment or whatever, just put a red rug in the middle of a room, 
And uh, with enough direct light, the room is kind of pink. It, this is a real, it's a real effect. It's exaggerated more when the space is smaller and the light's more intense. Okay? What does this mean? Like, why is, is this? None of these are just curiosities. I want, I want you guys to, 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 to see these because these are things that actually affect the way that, that, we, that we see space. Okay? And you might have unintended effects on your architecture if you're not aware of them. Right? So anyway, I just want you guys to. So, and we can see these in the rendering. There's another thing that's happening in this image. You see these like hot spots that are forming here, and the one that's happening on the back of the wall. You can see back here, this whole halo. Why is that happening? Refraction. Refraction, right? If you have like a magnifying, you guys burned ants or something, or, you know, right? You can get light to go through something. You can create like a hot spot. These are called caustics. And you'll see these. Another place they show up is on the surface. If you have a, a, a swimming pool that's indoors and you have light coming down on it, see the ceiling has all that stuff on it. It's another form of refraction. Okay, you can simulate that in you know in the computer. They get very very accurate. Okay. Okay. So this is actually a simulation of of a simulation. This is what happens when you fire off one of these like renderings. So the light is coming in through the windows. They're black because the, basically they're the light source. <coughs> they don't need to be represented. So they come in white, and they they are hitting objects in the room, and you'll, you're seeing the color of the object that they're like hitting. So there's actually like a red like kind of a red piece on the floor. And you can see the kind of red, like up in the corner. But this is the first pass. This is the first shotgun blast on this thing, and then um, and then it starts to fill in with some of the bounces. Okay. Then they go in with the paint roller, and this thing gets like smoothed over. Okay. Now you'll notice that like nothing has any like material on it at all because the computer doesn't really. It, it's taking the material into account, and that's how it's getting the color. But what it's doing is it's looking at areas of light and areas of shadow. And this is the sampling uh, pass. And again, I'm showing you this because when you're in the computer and you have to dial up and down the sampling, what that is is that that's the resolution of the, of the kind of paint spreader. Okay? If you have more samples, it's going to look uh, more like the actual image. Fewer samples, it's going to take less time, but it's going to be kind of rough initially. It's going to look kind of rough. Okay? So then we add materials to it in the computer. So basically we use this to determine like how bright or dark something is. And then the computer actually maps the materials like onto the piece. So the, the light is actually somehow is actually calculated separately from the from the way the, the piece looks. And then the, another pass. So we had this is this is the, the original texture pass. Then there's a pass that actually applies the ray tracing. And what ray tracing is is if you have reflections of materials, you literally Shoots a ray and it finds out like where that where that object should be drawn and it essentially creates another rendering of it and applies it to that surface to create the reflection. <coughs> so there's indirect illumination, texturing, and then ray tracing, and that's what's going to give you the reflection. So see the teapot, you can see the little globe here, you can see the the floor. That's like way too glossy. That thing's ridiculous. It's like a sheet of glass. Um, you can see that some of the shadows get like crisper because of the ray tracing. Okay, so take a look at this on your computer. It's kind of been nice to see. But when you hit render, that's actually what's happening. There's actually a series of passes that happen. Okay. 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 So you can see another another version of this. So this one has mirrors. If you literally have a mirror, like that's what's happening to it. You can see there's actually reflections on the on the on the, on the pictures. There's reflections on the edges of the chrome. A really, a really good rendering has a couple of qualities. I mean, first of all, I think they all have to have high contrast. And you can see this one has this area, the, the lightest area of contrast is the edge of this, of this sheet here. And it doesn't, it doesn't have a lot of dark contrast, I guess, but, but it's a very subtle like, image. It's not, it's not like Las Vegas, you know, right? It's not, not like this. This doesn't really look that real like, to, to me. This one's OK. But I kind of like the kind of understatedness of this one. So, so when you're actually trying to represent something that actually is realistic, you want to aim for some contrast for visual interest, but you want to kind of, the overall idea of it should be kind of understated. And this one has a lot of nice soft shadows. It's got a lot of textures applied to it to kind of give us uh, tone and texture. 
And actually, I guess the, the contrast could also be this, this towel. Uh, but anyway, so just once you, once you are starting to render things, like start observing things you see on Arch Daily and, and, and in other architects' renderings and ask yourself what makes them effective or what makes them like repulsive to you, okay? And try not to like do the bad stuff. I mean, really, really start to be critical about the images that you see, okay? Because now you're image makers, okay? You have these tools. Um, it's time to start having an opinion about that. Okay, so in V-Ray, I have a video that I, that I will do this with. I'm not going to go through it like in, in class, but this is the process. You don't get anything until you bake it, all right? Nothing comes out of Grasshopper until it's been, until it's been baked as geometry, okay? So if you render something and nothing shows up, you missed a step, okay? It's the first one. Then it's important to change the renderer to V-Ray. It's not on by default. The default is the Rhino renderer. Okay, that's another step. You won't get, you won't get the nice shadows. You, you get the crummy direct shadows. Then the important thing is to add cameras. Remember when we did the second year projects? Most of the, I'm, I'm talking mostly to the third years now, but the first thing you do is add a camera because you want to know what it is you're looking at and you want to, know, you want to keep that stable. Right? If you're just flying around with the, with the viewport, you don't have a fixed point to come back to. and you know, Then all the tweaks you make to this thing are, are not gonna like, help you because later on you'll change your position and it'll look bad, okay? So the first thing you do is set the camera up that you wanna use to render this thing, okay? Then you add the sun system, and that's in the video. And that, we're gonna be doing these as sun systems because it's easier. Then you add materials. If you don't have materials for objects, even if it's just a dull, like matte gray material, it won't render properly. The system has to know what you want to treat that material like. Even if it's just flat white house paint, it's gotta know something or you won't get any results. You won't, you won't get any bounces, it won't be pretty, okay? In your case, I'm gonna give you guys a flat material and you're, you're just gonna render yours as like styrene plastic or whatever, all right? It'll look like a model. Um, then you render it. <laughs> Then you play with the settings and you render it some more. Rendering is an iterative process. I'll describe this in the video. But it never works the first time. You've always got to tweak stuff. You got to go back to the dark room, play with the exposure, play with the light source, play with the material so you get the view you want, you get the, you get the settings you want. And rendering doesn't stop in the rendering. There's always some amount of post-production. The best rendering tool that you have is Photoshop. It's not V-Ray, it's not any, any other tool, it's Photoshop. You can take a mediocre rendering or a good enough rendering and you make it awesome in Photoshop. You can play with the contrast, you can play with the levels, you can add texture in Photoshop. If you're not, you know, if you're not comfortable doing it here, you can add scale figures to like help us understand the, 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 uh, the, uh, the project. We can add site. Um, all kinds of stuff happens in Photoshop. Okay? So don't, don't forget that, that step. Okay? It, barely, it rarely comes out perfect in V-Ray. Okay? All right. So uh, I'll put these up. These are not going to make any sense right now, but we'll go back to this slide later. It, it's, remember I said it's an iterative process. The part of it that you iterate is the number of samples you have. So you're going to start with a really rough rendering just to make sure that, the, that you've got the contrast and stuff right. Once you nail it, you, you like turn up the settings and then you go get a sandwich and then come back later because it'll take like a half an hour or something. Okay? So, just know that that's the process and, 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 and uh, always, always render really quick you know, versions of it first, and then do the good ones later. Okay. Don't render it at like ultra high settings because it's not going to help you. Okay, and we'll just, you can look at these later. Um, yeah, this is in the video, so I'll skip this. Oh, pay attention to the ground background. Like the worst thing in the world is if you have a rendering that just floats there, like it doesn't have any structure or it's not attached to any kind of a ground. Reviewers hate that. Also, ground gives you the light bounces, right, that are gonna like illuminate your, your model. So you gotta put ground in it. You can use, there's actually like an infinite plane object which just puts like an infinite piece of ground down there. That should be everyone's, if you don't have a site, that should be your first step, okay? Always have a ground, never turn in a rendering that doesn't have a ground underneath it. The other thing that ground gives you is shadow and that gives you a sense of the scale and, and a sense of how it meets the ground, okay? And give yourself enough time to iterate. If you do this at the last minute, you're not gonna have time to make these as good as they can be. So rendering is a time intensive uh, process. There are V-Ray materials that are included in the program. Materials, you know, we talk about glossy, we talk about transparent. Some of them even can, can actually apply other kinds of geometry like, like hair and grass and fur, okay? Your instructor may not like that very much. Um, I have some materials that I'm going to give you that I've collected over the years that, that are really nice for, uh, for presentations. They, um, 
I have basic glass and stone and, and metal and stuff like that. But the other ones that I have that I like a lot uh, are I have I have modeling material materials. So I have chipboard and cardboard and plexi, and so you can make your like model look like a sketch model, which may which may serve you well, <laughs> just for like a schematic you know purpose, right? What you don't want to do is paint the thing blue and orange and green and, and like a bunch of Legos or something like that. There's still something about like tactility and texture that, that you want to be want to be talking about. Another thing that you guys can look at, and, uh, and this is more just for an FYI, some of you guys have been doing like uh, chain link fences or, or really kind of you know like intricate models. If you've got something that's repetitive that you want, basically like, like this chair, this chair is supposed to have like holes in it. You might go into um, Rhino and model you know these things painstakingly and like boolean out these circles or or, or do some kind of grasshopper script. It really doesn't make sense to do that, especially if you're going to make a lot of these things, because it just takes up a huge amount of like, geometry. Pros like fake this stuff, basically, using what's called a transparency map. So if you make a texture of this chair, um, that's a transparency map, it'll actually render, this is just a texture, but it looks like, at, at a certain distance, it looks like that chair's got like holes in it, okay? See the difference here? So the light, the renderer will treat it as though it's geometry, because it's allowing light to pass through that texture in certain places and not pass through it in others. And that, this is what the texture looks like. The black ones are the, the, the things that are black are the things that let light through. The parts that are white don't let light through. Okay? If you have a project and you're trying to do some facade or like something like that, and it's like this, okay? if you want to do it, come talk to me. It, do not try to like model the whole thing. Like we'll, we'll make a texture map, and it'll be much faster for you. Okay? So much of, of, of like high-end rendering is actually just good textures. Like if you look at a lot of like Pixar stuff, if you guys have seen behind the scenes or like whatever, the models are not that detailed. It's all done in the texturing and the lighting and stuff like that. That's the way architecture should be done too. Okay? It doesn't make a lot of sense. Like, like I would not model this brick wall and then model you know, all the mortar joints or like whatever. This is one surface and I would apply a texture to it. Okay? And that goes for so many things. Okay? Don't, don't over model stuff. It'll drive you crazy. I had a student one year that was doing a, a, a section of a building, and she modeled the she modeled like the decking material, like the whole you know all of the things in the deck, and, and extruded it for the entire building, and it wouldn't render. And she didn't know why it wouldn't render, and the file was like 500 megabytes, and it was just all like repetitive you know stuff that could have just been a texture, or could have been eliminated altogether. But she modeled the entire building, like every little rivet, every little thing. You know, and it just you guys can't afford that amount of time and it won't it won't come out for you. Okay? So things like this, if you guys have problems, come talk to me or talk to JP. We'll help you get your models down to size with these kind of tricks. Okay. Um, textures can do all kinds of things. Um, you can, this is so uh, this this is a uh, bump map. So again, you have a dumb, you know, kind of teapot like object. If you have a black and white map, you can also use it to tell the computer to to render shadows on things. If you look at this really closely, you're not going to see any kind of an edge, but from a distance, it looks like it has a texture. It looks like it. It looks like it's kind of this brick, kind of crinkly kind of thing. Okay, you can fake a lot with like texture. This is how most of your video games like work. As a matter of fact, video games have to play very fast, and so they don't push a lot of polygons. They push a lot of textures. It's cheaper that way. Okay, so again, if you have something a material like a wood material or a brick material, like whatever, you want to make that work. Don't model it. Talk to me. We'll get you a texture for it. Okay. Um, so yeah, just like this is the way video games work. You can have multiple textures. Actually, I apologize for the violence. For the gratuitous violence. You can have multiple textures laying on top of each other. So this is this is an example of what's going on on these like cobblestones here. You have a bump map and you have um, a gloss map, so which is actually treating it as if it's like a, a, a rain-soaked surface. Okay, and they're layered on top of each other, and that's how you actually get some of these effects. Some of these things have up to 16 textures applied on the same thing, and all they are, this whole thing is just a dumb, like, plane. But with enough, with enough texture, you can really make it look like a cobblestone street, like a wet cobblestone street. Okay, you guys won't need to do this for your projects, but the point is, don't spend some time with materials, maybe not in this project, but maybe in your own projects, because the secret, the secret to good rendering, one of the secrets, is to invest in like the materiality of it. Okay, it's what's going to make so many people just make these gray models that they just put out, and there's no life to them, and, and we don't, you know, there's 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 so much that you can think about in terms of the way something's made and the way that it works in the world. 
if you if you just take a minute to think about that that like layer, and and we'll help you with it. You know, um, if you guys have questions, we can certainly consult with you about that. So, take a look at the two videos that I've given you for this week, um, and and um, focus on the diagramming one, and then maybe take a take a minute and look at the uh, like rendering one. I'm only asking for a couple of renderings, and they're going to be really basic. But I want you guys to practice it. Okay, remember these are group projects. If you have partners, so you can actually like divide the labor up. So don't. Hopefully, this will be. It won't be too much trouble for you guys over this uh, midterm week. Um, you're basically just documenting the work you've done. Okay. If you have questions, let me know. Otherwise, be prepared for uh, midterm when you come back to lab.